The Balrog has a wife and kid and just wants to live in peace. <laughs> At this point, what's even down there? Maybe this is Steve the Balrog, a different one, alive in the Second Age. Bob the Balrog's cousin. <laughs> It's so crazy to me how they can just blatantly rip off that scene specifically. Is there like some sort of copyright issue? Because the imagery for the Balrog taking the whip and getting Durin's foot, it seems just so directly taken from the Peter Jackson films. I honestly don't know how it was able to get to that point where it so blatantly rips off the actual sequence of events. How are they allowed to do this? Like to this degree? to rip off those films. It's kind of a similar thing to maybe not as blatantly as this one, but when Elendil gets Narsil, it is very similar, not as epic though. Honestly, it's a very stripped down version of Aragorn getting the reforged Narsil, but definitely evokes that same exact imagery. And the way he pulls out the sword, looks at it, that part right there was like the exact same. A lot of this stuff was very anticlimactic. It's like, well, that happened and then Something else was like, okay, that happened. Next. <laughs> Nothing really stood out as truly epic or satisfying. So they had to wrap up the dwarves storyline here with King Durin so that they could then go to Eregion to finally go to the elves' aid. And you think they would have built up that moment, similar to the Rohirrim showing up, but now they're just there. They're just suddenly there in the battle and it's not satisfying. And they built up this moment of the dwarves not showing up and the hope that they would, and they're just there. There's nothing really to build up the drama and tension of the moment and their arrival. There's so many moments like that in this episode. The finale is supposed to be truly satisfying, like wrapping up all these things and having these massive payoffs, especially of the previous episode that set all these things up. And a lot of it just falls flat and just comes across as very anticlimactic, very underwhelming. I honestly don't know how fans of the show could walk away from it thinking that this is a satisfying. It's so amateurish. Needed to get the Balrog in before it's canceled. That's the feeling that I'm getting. Well, the fact that they teased it so much, two whole seasons worth, were they really going to tease it that much going forward? I don't know. I know they did reshoots, so it's possible that this was tacked on, but we all knew what was going to happen too. So this scene just feels so very underwhelming, but laughably so. The Balrog doesn't want war. He's just trying to provide for his family. Sauron will continue to be lonely and cry again, and Muriel will have Stockholm Syndrome or something. <laughs> Oh gosh, it just plays out so soap opera. And the orcs, I've seen this in other trades, mainstream media sites saying the orcs, the way they handled them are bad. The Harfoots, the way they handled that story is bad. So even like, you know, mainstream media isn't making excuses anymore. I think Weta had sold their Balrog CGI model to Amazon. I wonder how much it costs. I mean, tack that on to the uh, budget of which they've spent a billion dollars <laughs> for two seasons. Durin's brother was mentioned in season one in a side sentence, I think, when Disa had her Lady Macbeth episode. <laughs> That's hard to remember, like when they just do little things like that, that they never call back to. We're not going to mention it again because Prince Durin and his dad, King Durin, oh jeez, that's why I don't have multiple Durins. They had like so many family discussions, struggle sessions, so much of that was talking about, you know, having these heart to hearts which some of it was actually okay, I didn't mind, but there was just a lot of it. And I think too much, like there needed to be more of like Prince Durin taking action. And even when they were close to him going to action, going to war to help Elrond, well, they stopped that pretty quickly so he could address his father's going crazy off screen. And so every time you think he's gonna take action and do something, something gets in the way. Same thing with like Elendil, Elendil too hasn't done anything this season. And Isildur, these amazing characters with histories that are legendary in the history of this canon and lore. And they're just relegated to side characters, just extras almost. Elendil didn't do anything. Like he just reacts to things that other characters are doing. He's not taking action himself. And Isildur, same thing. Honestly, his horse was more heroic and did more than Isildur himself. It's so sad and so blatant how they're mistreating Tolkien's characters. And the fact that the original characters that they put in here are given more care, which, you know, isn't saying much, but people tend to appreciate the original characters more because they're doing something more with them. There's more thought there. 
Meanwhile, they're just like keeping a seal door and Elendil like off to the side and Prince Durin off to the side. It's such a disservice to these legacy characters and also a disservice to the viewer. We just have all these characters and most of them have like nothing of substance to do. How could a finale of this ever be satisfying? The only satisfaction will be the announcement that there will be no season three. <laughs> it's been a week already, hasn't it? Almost. It's been a week since the finale aired. No concrete official confirmation of season three. We have some vague mentions of a writer being assigned, but that's still not an official word from Amazon. And it kind of is already in keeping with what Payne and Kay have already said that they were doing some movements in pre-production and development, but nothing official has come down from Amazon yet. And I feel like it won't if they've already spent a billion dollars. So they've already spent 426 million on season one alone, just producing that. That is before the rights. So including the rights, yeah. So we're like almost 800 million right there. That's just absolutely insane for what we ended up getting. And now in season two, we're clearly having a lot of VFX heavy imagery and new sets, new locations. Obviously the budget's not being used to great effect because a lot of it looks cheap, at least when it comes to the sets and costumes and armor and weapon design. That's so unfortunate that the one time they decide to not be derivative is when it comes to the design of the weapons and armor and costumes. Like, I'm fine with you kind of ripping off some of the aesthetics and design from the Peter Jackson film so you can kind of see where you get inspiration from. But no, everything looks like it's made of pleather, fake leather, faux soft materials. I don't know what's worse, the show or Amazon Twitter accounts. Oh man, don't get me started on the marketing for this. The online marketing for this show has been so atrocious. And I don't know if they think that they're helping, if they actually think that they are helping this situation by saying how much Sauron is a girl boss, a mean girl, or that he's a menace in the front and dainty in the back, talking about his Barbie hair bow hairstyle. It's <laughs> like, what are y'all doing? If you can't take it seriously, how do you expect anyone else to? The visuals is all they have and they know it. It's just trailer bait. There's some great still shots. I mean, if you take Durin out of this still, Balrog looks amazing. I have no qualms. I have no problems with the Balrog design, although it's not original to the show, but there's other things that looks pretty. The Barrow Whites looked pretty, looked cool. They don't belong there, but yeah, then the show has to happen. People have to talk to each other and it's just still as dirt in between all those.